So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribes. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. Most people don't get a chance at three fascinating careers, but one exception to that is Republican Representative Mike Rohrkast of Nina, who is, well, he was a business executive for 30 years. He was in the State Assembly for six. He's announced that he's leaving the State Assembly, not seeking re-election, for a very exciting and very challenging role dealing with Alzheimer's. So, Representative, thanks very much for your time. Steve, thanks for having me on. Um, I was intrigued by your floor peach speech saying, excuse me, that you're not seeking re-election. You have found your next calling. Talk mm -hmm. about your next calling. I'm the executive director for what's called the Fox Valley Memory Project, and we help families between Kaconic, Kimberly, New London, Nina, and throughout Appleton that are facing the journey of dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia, yes. but we are helping them and their care partners um, live as well and as safe and as joyfully as they can in what is a very challenging situation. We want to keep them engaged in community activities. We want to make sure that caregivers take care of themselves. And we just want to help these families with whatever resources they need as the dementia progresses and changes throughout their life. That's fascinating. I want to come back to that. Let's talk about your, the arc of your career. 30 years in private business, you were a human resource manager, that was your whole experience. Then you retired and chose to run for the assembly. Why? Um, I did not have a goal of running for office at that point in time. <laughs> um, Dean Cofford was in the seat for over 20 years. Uh, he, uh, timing can be everything sometimes, and he became the mayor. And right around the time that I was ending my career at Oshkosh Corporation, Oshkosh Truck, yes. and, um, uh, and, he, and a few people suggested that I consider running. And I did. I ended up winning the primary and then won the general, and I'm in my third term, but, but I'm now moving on to, as you mentioned, another career. Had you held any local office before? No, never. And so you had one set of expectations as a first-time candidate mm -hmm. for the state assembly, and you won. Um, how, how different was your expectations and the reality when you came to the Capitol, I think, in 2015? Well, the first thing is just running a campaign and running to win one is extremely hard work. So I give kudos to anybody, whatever party, if you run and really work, it is one of the most challenging and rewarding things that you'll ever do. Whether you win or lose, it is a very eye-opening experience, so I'm glad that I did it especially glad that I won. Uh, and it was a, it's been, a, it, overall, it was a great experience to come into the state legislature. Um, people were very welcoming to me as an individual, um, leadership, uh, speaker boss, very welcoming to me and my background, uh, wanting to use my human resources, my years of experience in workforce development, understanding healthcare. Uh, also just in, in large companies, you have to know how to get things done. So I think they, and, and I was pleased that I was given opportunities to do those and worked on some things individually that, and pushed them through, but also was given opportunities to work on some projects. But how different is a private sector executive from the way this building works, <laughs> Representative? Um, the biggest difference is that we're elected by the people. We don't actually work for leadership directly. Um, that's probably the biggest difference. I mean, but moving legislation through either the House or the Senate has some distinct similarities to business. And I will, and I've mentioned this to a few organizations, if you want to be a good legislator, you either should come in with good project management skills or learn them. Right. Because you really have to what you have to do is, if you're coming in to fix an issue, you gotta make sure you understand that issue. If you're coming in to see what needs to be fixed, and then you need to do the same thing. You figure out, so what's, what's wrong with an existing system or a law or something, a budget issue? What do we want to achieve? You know, what's the gap between those two, your mm -hmm. current state and where you want to be? And then you have to figure out a plan to get there. And you have to build consensus. You have to get people to agree with you. Um, but that's not all that different. I mean, uh, 
companies are not dictatorships where the CEO just in a 15,000 employee company just says go do this and everybody does it. It takes communication, it takes feedback back and forth, it takes listening to different views. Luckily I had CEOs and people that I worked with that did that. Um, but the legislature is very similar. But then you have to figure out how to overcome those obstacles if it still makes sense and then to continue to move that forward. But legislators really have to know how to move something from beginning to end and deal with, the, the, and deal with it in a positive way, not in a um, critical way. The partisan nature of this building, though, um, private sector business at the executive level sure. is not, there's not that much of partisanship. It's different, right? That is. Do you remember uh, your first partisan sure. reality check? Yes. Yes. That is. A, no. That is a good. Yes. Then that is sometimes a frustration down here, that we don't get things done that we might be able to because either one party or the other doesn't want to give the other one a win, and that's where politics enters into what is good policy, or may hinder what could be better policy. Those are frustrating. They happen. That is part of our political system. Um, but I don't want to dwell on, I mean, yes, that, you can look at that as a negative, but you know, I'd rather look at things from the positive. There's a lot of things that we have got done and a lot of bipartisan work that we've, we've achieved together, both parties, um, doesn't get talked about all that much um, in, some, in some areas, but nonetheless, it's there. And, and I know that now. I know it much better than I did before. Um, yeah, I wish there could be more, and maybe there will be, but that's the system that we have. But again, I want to look at things from a positive standpoint. I had a great boss one time who said, when things go wrong, you can be mad and get aggravated for about 30 seconds. You know, maybe it takes me 30 minutes. He could get over things in 30 seconds, but I used to take longer than 30 minutes. So, uh, and then you have to move on, and then you have to go, okay, so if this didn't work, or let's go a different path. Let's try to figure out something. The other thing I'd say, Steve, is that compromise does occur here, but we need to talk about it, that it's a good thing, not a bad thing. I think sometimes both pe people within both parties think compromise is a bad thing, and it's not, because we compromise on issues within our parties, we compromise with, between the parties. The budget is an example of compromise, this last time. Governor Evers put out a very one-sided budget we worked with it, and you know, it, to his credit, he signed the entire budget. He yes. could have vetoed the entire budget. And it wasn't what he wanted, but he agreed to sign it, which was in the best interest of the people of Wisconsin. Now, I don't agree with everything like Governor Evers you know, has done or mm -hmm. his policies, but I do give him credit for signing that budget. Now, none of the other Democrats, though, voted for that budget at all, even though they knew that it was a better budget than what had existed in the prior budget so for many of the issues that they wanted addressed. Were they hedging their bets, bets knowing that it, in some ways it was a reasonable, bu a reasonable budget, knowing that the governor would sign it? I don't know, maybe, but I don't. So I can speak to JFC since I was on joint finance on the budget committee. Basically, whenever they offered an alternative proposal during our sessions, it was almost always exactly the governor's position. They never moved off the governor's position. Okay. Um, I'm a former HR person. I've done a lot of labor negotiating. That is actually considered in labor relations, considered an unfair labor practice to not actually give alternatives back and forth into it's considered unfair bargaining. Now, that's different. I'm not c accusing them of unfair bargaining. Right, different so, environment. Different environment, but right. a similar principle, though. Yes. Um, they basically were staying with, this is, this is what we want, all or nothing. Okay. And candidly, I don't think we would have maybe put as much money into certain areas or structured that budget, the ending, the budget like we did, if Governor Evers had not won. Personally, I, as a legislator and as a budget member, I felt that it was incumbent upon me to, to take what the people of Wisconsin said. They elected a Democratic governor. They elected a Republican legislature. They expected us to come up with a budget. So that meant we had to compromise. We had to, on our side, do some things we might not normally want to do. We might want to, we might probably would have wanted more tax cuts, but 
No, we put more into education, put more into roads, because that's what people were saying in the election. So right. we were trying to do actually what people want us to do, but it doesn't get portrayed that way. Just one more question <laughs> on partisanship. If you could wave a wand and we're going to stay oh. in the legislature, how would you reduce the partisanship? Two ways, I think. And the, the first way is I think both parties have to acknowledge that they are that that they are going to seriously reach out and compromise, which could result in giving the other party a win or a, a win in the next election cycle. Yeah. As long as they get a win. So it needs to be reciprocal. They don't both need to get wins. So that's number one. And number two, a lot of the positioning occurs without talking at all before they go to the press. Okay. So people can, they put out their bill, their, their budget item or their proposal, and it's done, make, they make it, and, and both sides can do it. They can make it sound like, you know, we've talked with people and maybe they have a little, but they haven't really explored. There needs to be much more talking between people individually and figuring out where we can work together and then keeping that and keeping the rhetoric to a minimum when the cameras go on and when the press is there because then they seem to people change and then they become more critical we can't be we shouldn't be critical of, of different views we should be trying to come up with better solutions so instead of saying why something is wrong with something say this is another alternative that we could look at but usually we don't start that way it's, well, this is dead on arrival, or this is the wrong way to do it. And that just sets people, puts them in their corners. It doesn't bring them together, it puts them in their corners. Assembly Democratic Leader Hintz said the real tone for this session was set by the lame duck legislation. Did, you're leaving. Did your party overreach with that lame duck legislation? I don't, no, I don't think so. Um, and I had to think through that quite a bit because the timing of it, sure, did not look good. Um, a lot of the, uh, I think most of what we passed though was, was good policy. And some of it was policy that we had put into budgets under Governor Walker and he vetoed him out of there. Or we tried to work with him on getting, um, we felt that the executive branch, even under Governor Walker, had too much, could uh, maybe influence versus involving the legislature on th certain things. Right. So, so I think a number of those were just good policy. Now the timing obviously looks bad, I get it. And um, the other thing is, is that we, there was a lot of the proposals and a lot of the proposals that came out that we could have done, many of them we didn't do because I felt some of them were overreach. So um, I think overall what we ended up doing was not. I mean, maybe you could, you could argue individual parts of maybe what we did, sure. You could, we could debate that if they were overreach or not. But I thought we removed a number of items that were overreach. Changing the election on the Supreme Court candidate, we did not do that. That was initially proposed. I think that is an example. That was something I was personally concerned about because I thought it was that was too much, even if it, in the policy was, maybe it made sense, but it was so political. You argued yeah. against that in caucus? Uh, I did, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, I thought, well, yes, I did. I argued, I thought, that, I thought that we would be taking a risk doing that because it really just smacks of absolute partisanship. So yeah. anyway. Well, um, because of your business experience and ability to negotiate, that's, th those were factors why the speaker put you on finance on your third term, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Third term is a place where future leaders arise. Um, did you think about, your, had, had you stayed in the assembly where you could be in another two terms as a real senior leader? Was that ever a factor? Um, actually, I was on in my second term. Thank I'm you saying, for the yeah, correction. That's okay. Um, which makes it even more. Um, uh, but uh, I... Um, makes it even more unusual. Most second term sure. assembly members don't go to finance. So you did, but thank you for the correction. Um, yeah, I did think about it. And, but um, a couple things that I thought about in the last year or so. One is I made a decision that I really didn't want to run for any other seat other than what I was in, state assembly. You know, whether a federal seat or another down the road. I really thought I wanted to serve my time, serve the state of Wisconsin. I'm in my third term. 
I was thinking I would maybe run one more time. I do believe strongly in term limits. I, and I think that if we don't have them, then individuals, I would have term limited myself to basically eight years. Mm -hmm. So given that, then this opportunity of what I'm doing yes. came up. So it, it just, everything worked out uh, very well. Um, and so I don't think people should stay in long term. And I know not everybody, my colleagues that I totally respect, they disagree with me on that. They think we, we shouldn't have term limits. And, and I, I do respect that. But I think, I think particularly at our federal level, it definitely is needed. And if we do it at the federal, why not do it at the state too? Your three terms, your biggest satisfaction, what you consider your biggest, biggest uh, accomplishment? Definitely the Alzheimer's work, uh, or the work on Alzheimer's and dementia. Heading up that task force, not only what we were able to accomplish with the bills that we got passed, we got three bills passed, but then in the subsequent budgets, we got more work done on it because of the awareness, because of education that we were able to generate greater awareness and understanding of the need and then help with solutions on that. It, it actually also led to greater Medicaid funding for nursing homes and assisted living because a lot of that funding is going to help them with memory care units. Those are people that are living with dementia in those areas and they needed that extra funding. So the work that we that that task force did and I can't that was and that was a group effort. There was a, there was a bipartisan group. I want to give everybody on that committee or that task force credit because everybody really participated. And that was probably the most satisfying and maybe the long lasting. Um, there's one other, if I could, that was Please. very um, satisfying to me and that was, um, had to do with tissue density for in mammography. And um, a constituent came to me with an issue because it's an example of where literally a person came to me as their legislator on an issue that I knew nothing about and explained to me what the current law was, explained to me what she thought the law should be and why and how it could actually improve healthcare outcomes. And, and I'm like, well, okay, that sounds interesting and sounds good, but I knew nothing about it. But it's an example of where a constituent did something and actually a bill was put through, passed unanimously, both houses, bipartisan support, and was signed last session by Governor Walker. And it has to do with tissue density, and uh, which is part of uh, uh, tissue density is great causes greater risk that tumors could be missed in normal mammo mammography. Right. Okay. And so all the bill did was take existing information from a mammography report and tell the patient if they had the higher risk tissue density, and then they could discuss with their doctor if they should go for other tests to make sure that there wasn't. So, so this was, uh, and basically this lady that brought it forward, she had tumors and never got caught till she was in stage three breast cancer. It took a bill to allow yeah. a physician to, to discuss? Um, no, they, 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 had the, they, they could have, but actually as I learned, and this is not a knock on, we gotta be careful not to knock the healthcare community because and I'm, I know you're not doing that, but people may want to do that. But the constituent, she said, Mike, I am not mad at the, my doctor or they, because they didn't know. This is, it's, it's been around for a while, but it's just like anything. I mean, a, a doctor is only as good as the information that they continually receive as the medical community finds more information out about issues like this. So... For example, my wife actually, this has got personal to me and I didn't even know it, has, she's at number one, she has two risk factors for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's in her family and she's had a benign lump removed and she doesn't mind me talking about this. Um, and she did not know this, but she has high tissue density too. Oh. And until I did this bill and I explained to her what I was doing, she's like, oh, that's interesting. She talked to her provider when their next mammography report and asked, is there, they knew nothing about the tissue density issue. This is a so, this is a fascinating example of how a bill becomes a law. Right. One person comes to you. Yes. You know nothing about it. Right. You do the research. Right. Then you check with some of the special interest groups on both sides. Did they have a big problem with it? Uh, no. We we worked with everybody. We worked with we got the UW Medical School, their radiologist. We got the radiology association, the hospitals, the doctors. We wanted the healthcare insurers. 
We wanted to make sure nobody was going to have issues. I mean, sure, maybe they, nobody ever wants more mandates because if they miss something, then they're going to get fined or whatever. Yeah. However, though, in this, they all said, no, this is good policy. This is a good practice. We should be, you know, you could argue they should have been doing it on their own and could have done it on their own. But again, sometimes it takes something like this to get more education out to the healthcare community. I mean, we know more, I'm back to Alzheimer's and dementia, we know more about those two issues today than we yes. did 10 years ago, yeah. and or we did five years ago. And so there's always more information coming. So this is in no way a, you know, a, a knock on the healthcare community. I think they overall do a great job, but it just shows that sometimes literally a person can make a difference in future people's lives, and she did. Uh, you dealt with healthcare issues in your human resource career. You worked on healthcare issues in the legislature. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, how, with the backdrop, the national debate, Medicare for all and uh, public option and abolish the ACA, how well does this legislature respond to some, some of these major healthcare issues? Effectively uh, or too slowly or not very effectively? Well, there, there's, there's limitations because of the federal laws and yes. because of the way Medicare and Medicaid is set up and uh, to do things outside of guidelines, you have to get waivers. So it's, it's not always easy for states to operate. Um, it's a, I could talk another uh, two hours, and I know we don't have that much time on this issue, um, so I won't do that. Uh, however, though, I will give uh, my quick opinion is that the state and federal governments, the only way we're really going to lower health care costs is by creating greater transparency in pricing, mm -hmm. provide some solution to Medicaid reimbursements to providers because that's one reason they don't want transparency because they get much lower reimbursement than a private pay insurance. So they don't want people to know because of that reason partly because of that. So we need to figure out some way to fix that. And then the other thing is, is we need to be focused much more on preventative wellness. And I mean, when I was at healthcare plan at Oshkosh, I mean, we knew what was causing a lot of our healthcare costs. And probably 70% at least of our costs were being caused by choices. Yes. Smoking, drinking, Eat to excess, um, eating to excess, uh, not exercising, uh, not taking your medications if you're diabetic, not taking your insulin shots. Did you watch an increase in drug abuse affecting wor workplace performance? Um, not a ton, actually. Okay. Not at the time. Now, again, I've been out six years. So, right. um, so no, go back. You, uh, you, you, we, we, you, see it in the, we saw it in families sometimes with you kids. You knew the main drivers then. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And I don't think they've changed. Okay. Um, so we, we, need, we need to make people better consumers and better understanding. And I think if they really understood what their healthcare costs are. So this just happened to me and it's a step in the right direction. I'm gonna have a hip replacement in less than two weeks. The hospital called I'm gonna have one six months, six oh. weeks from today. Oh good, so we can compare notes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the hospital just called me yesterday and they told me exactly what it's gonna cost they told me what my insurance cost is and they went through my deductible and they went and they told me what my what I'm going to have to pay first time that that has ever happened to me but that's what needs to happen that's a start so then i can Do I need to be sitting down when i get that call yes, about Yes you do by the way I, I, I do okay hope, yeah you probably do thank you um, but at least they did it so i know now so let's say for example i mean if i wanted to i could literally go shop but probably find it done cheaper no I'm not going to do that because I trust the doctor and I think it's probably reasonable, but I'm more concerned I want the right doctor to take care of me. Okay. And that's fine, but I'm knowing that. That's an informed decision. Two years ago, if I would have had this done, it would have been this black hole. And I've tried to get those costs from uh, hospitals before, and it's a runaround. Right. So I am thrilled, and I'm not sure why, if they're doing this on their own or something's come from the feds on this, because I know Trump has talked about try wanting more transparency, but I'm thrilled that um, literally two hospitals in my area, Bell, and I'll give them a shout out, Bellin and ThetaCare, uh, they are giving, they are telling you up front what the procedure is gonna cost. That's what we need to do. One now, of the things. Now I wanna go to the cry of your heart, mm -hmm. your, 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 your third job, your third yeah, profession. Sure. 
uh, making a difference with Alzheimer's. Did a member of your family have Alzheimer's? Uh, don't know exactly. It was a form of dementia, yes. yes. So it could have been Alzheimer's. We never actually got a formal diagnosis or had that tested. Um, she had many of those symptoms, but she had symptoms of other forms of dementia as well. Okay. Um, she suffered from memory loss, um, paranoia. Uh, that got worse, and the anger. Uh, so it was a very difficult situation. I didn't really understand what was happening, so this is about maybe 10 years or a little 10 mm -hmm. years ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, I wish I would have understood better. I might have been able to help her. She was living in Ohio. I was working at Oshkosh Corp, traveling a lot and very busy, and, but then trying to help her. There wasn't very good support services in Ohio. And that's one thing in Wisconsin. We do have a lot of good, whether some state and then local and uh, not-for-profit support systems that help families with this disease. What differences does your organization make in the lives of those uh, with family, I mean, with Alzheimer's and family members who love them? We have an equal goal of helping both of them. We want to give people that are living with a form of dementia, Alzheimer's is the most common diagnosis, about 70% of people, that's probably what it is. Uh, we want to give them a chance to stay engaged in community activities, whether that's going to a library and listening to a performance by a local trio of singers. Uh, whether that's going to dinner with a group of other similar people that are living with dementia and their care partners at a restaurant. They wouldn't go individually, but we form, we do this in groups mm -hmm. and they will come out in a group because they know that we've made sure the restaurant is uh, going to have any facilities that they might need, is they know that they're going to have other people to help them because they don't always know what might happen with a person with dementia when they right. go out into the public. So they tend to seclude themselves. We are giving them opportunities to stay engaged. Another program that we do is we offer a free training service to any organization. Um, we've been actually working with a lot of credit unions in the Fox Cities here recently. It's good customer service skills for their tellers, for people with memory loss and understanding it, but also giving them some signs that maybe there could be they could be being taken advantage of from a financial. Elder fraud uh, is becoming a much bigger issue. So we're trying to educate businesses, and so that's an example. We also provide it to like restaurants or stores to explain that uh, when somebody exhibits these behaviors, they might have memory loss, and here are some tips, here are some things you can do. Rather than explain where the restroom is or where something is, literally take them to there. Okay. That would be, it's, just, and it's basically good customer service skills, but with understanding some of the behaviors, the symptoms that could be evident in a public setting. And again, to give that, not just the person with it, but the care partner is going to feel much better that their loved one is being uh, given extra attention by the people, whether it's a teller at the bank or the server at the restaurant. But is the initial reaction to someone who's having memory issues, oh, it can't be that, I'm just having a bad day, and uh, sure. do family members then still try to hide it? Is there more open recognition and seeking of help for someone who may have Alzheimer's? Uh, yes and yes, and there, there is more recognition and I think help. It's moving in the right direction, but there still is a lot of denial and a lot of wanting to try to hide it. Um, do you think I, we'll ever cure it? I hope so, but right now it's not promising. The medical community is getting better at, or will be able to easier, to more easily diagnose it uh, mm -hmm. through spinal tap tests, blood tests, uh, behavioral tests like they do now, and, and while you're still, you know, while, you, while you're going through it. So they might be able to, which could help uh, the person's journey and help the caregiver to plan and prepare for some of the challenges that will occur. Uh, so that, I think, is a positive thing, but some people still don't want to acknowledge it, and they, and as I mentioned, there's been a lot of research on people with dementia. The, if they withdraw, then a caregiver with, will withdraw probably too. Oh, I see. And then you will have two people that will withdraw from social interactions, may withdraw from getting the health care that they need, won't go out both of their health will decline, including the caregivers. Yes. Their risks go up exponentially if they don't take care of themselves. We are trying to keep people, give them opportunities to do things they did before they were diagnosed, to still do those same kind of things in a safe, fun environment 
but then also make sure we also provide them re referral services. We mm -hmm. work with different healthcare organizations. We have two doctors on our board actually. Uh, we work, we have uh, individuals from skilled nursing, so in assisted living, uh, personal care workers, home safety. So if they need help in those areas, we also provide referrals. We really just want to help them live as well as they can during what's a very difficult journey. I want to say more live well, but I know some people, you, it, it is, it's a hard thing. And, and I, I see what the disease has done and I see that what the caregivers are going through. And um, yeah, I said my thing was hard to campaign. It's nowhere near as hard as somebody caring for somebody with Alzheimer's right. or another uh, form of dementia. Covering the building for a few decades, I respect legislators who decide, okay, I, I wanted to serve, I served, and now I'm leaving, on, I'm choosing to retire. Mm -hmm. What advice will you give your successor? A couple things is, um, whether you're good at project management or you're not, learn it. <laughs> because you've got, to, you've got to figure out how to get things done. Uh, you also have to have patience and you have, to, you have to be willing to compromise within your own party even at times. And you have to say, okay, is, is good, um, good enough rather than the best? Let's make progress. Sometimes things don't get fixed like that. So take your time figure out what you want to try to accomplish, uh, and then put a plan together. The other thing I would say is, is listen and understand both sides of the issue. Even if you disagree with the other side, understand why they are, why they take their position. Uh, I never turned down a meeting with any group, whether, and even if they came in and, and I knew that they were going to have a position that I may not agree with or our caucus may not agree with but I did it because that's one my job yeah. and two I always learned something yeah and I had a greater understanding of why they were advocating from their their position it may not change my position or uh, but it could it, it could think it could cause me to think of something else I'm a big believer that there's you have to make connections in information so the more that you learn, then the greater the connection can be. And sometimes they're unrelated, uh, but it's a, it can be a connection, or it may seem unrelated, but there can be a connection that actually is made. You're, a, a, as a member of the Assembly, you're a Republican leader in Wisconsin. What do you think President Trump has done well in his first term and maybe not so well? So um, I would, I think that the President has done a lot of good policy issues. I agree with many of the policy decisions. I think he has put good uh, justices not only on the Supreme Court but in many of the circuit, and he's filled a lot of open positions that needed to get filled. So I think I give him high marks in that. I think that the tax cut and the pro, more pro small and large business environment was critical to getting the economy that was going okay, but to really get it moving and would continue to be if it wasn't for this for this for this coronavirus. Uh, I also think that he has an unorthodox style, yes. <laughs> a very unorthodox, and like particularly in foreign policy. But candidly, it, our last few presidents on both sides of the aisle have tried the same things and nothing worked. And he has a potential peace deal with the Taliban. Um, we've not had any rockets fired out of North Korea for a while. And I'm not saying he's fixed the problems, he hasn't. And he knows, he, I'm sure he knows he hasn't fixed those problems. But he's bringing an unorthodox style that I think we should be more, or at least say, let's see what happens rather than immediately criticize just because it hasn't been done before. Now, on the other side, as politician, he makes my job a little harder sometimes <laughs> because of some of the stuff he says. He is, um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very egotistical, bombastic New Yorker that kind of just says whatever comes to his mind and I wish he would change. I wish he would have, he could have probably done a better job of uniting our country if he can change. I just, I don't know that he can, but I, I, I wish that he would have because our country is very politically divided and not, not and just forget the policy division, but just there's anger yeah. and there's, and that's what's, sad and both parties I think are to blame for it or you could look at there's people on both sides to blame for that but I think that anger against each other is so unproductive and then we won't get things done that we should get done.
business experience, success in the legislature. Why, why have you now said, I'm never going to run for partisan office, what, never going to run for the state senate, congress, or state, statewide office? Well, <laughs> I, I don't know if I said never. Did I say never? Well, maybe I did. <laughs> but I highly doubt it, yes. Okay. I well, had no intention. I have no intention to. Why? I, because... Is it not an honorable profession? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I see your question. I'm sorry, yeah. I, and the only reason I say that is because, uh, and you can edit this out, you know, or however you guys want to, but uh, is that, um, you know, I always have learned never to say never to, because I never thought I'd get into politics, and I don't think that I will get back in, but I, I don't like to ever say never. If I did, maybe I misspoke. You have no However, intention. I have no intention. I do. I have no intention of going back into politics. Um, and the... And I'm sorry, give me that question again, well, given that. Then. Have you been, have you learned so much about politics that you have no intention of seeking no, office again? No, uh, it's, um, I have a passion for doing this. Um, I, I did not know I ended up in politics, and then when I got in politics, I did not know that probably the signature work that I would do would be on Alzheimer's and dementia, um, but I almost feel that um, that's just been a, a plan, and uh, you know, God has led me. You know, and I will say that I feel as God has led me to this, um, and I love what I'm doing. It's hard sometimes because you see the challenges that the individual and the families are having, and uh, but it's a need, and this is a way for me to use those skills. I'm still going to advocate. I've learned how to advocate down here too, so I still they'll, they'll, I'll be a, a good advocate for. Um, uh, dementia-related legislation, elder care issues, and uh, just good policy on uh, on helping provide the services, and not only do, just fiscally, you know, using our money better. I still I've got ideas that we could probably spend maybe less, but provide better services, particularly in some of these areas. So I'm going to continue to adv advocate. So I've learned a lot. I tend to want to stay on the positive side. Look at what went right, not what went, went wrong. Republican Representative Mike Rohrcast of Nina is completing his third term in the 55th Assembly District. Representative, thanks for taking the time to Wisconsin Eye, and good luck on your third career. Well, Steve, thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you for the last almost going on six years here. So take Thank care. you very much. Thanks. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 